2001. The new millennium. Isn't that futuristic enough for now, for us? And it is this summer. It's perfect. Ash felt more like my twin than my boyfriend sometimes. Like a part of me that always should have been there, but somehow got forgotten. And chartreuse, it was the taste of our nights that summer in Ash's room. When darkness fell beyond the tall trees, we smoked weed out of the window or down on the patio in the moonlight, then washed away the taste of burning herbs with green tingling gulps of herbal liquor brewed by the holy hands of a million monks. That was the first memory of my entire life that I wanted to freeze frame, capture forever. The sunlight still feels warm. The summer breeze still blows in that frozen crystal moment deep inside my mind. So hello you wonderful people and welcome back to another chapter of the Nostalgia Project. If you have missed the previous chapters I will link the playlist below but if you haven't caught up then I think you will be okay. I think you can jump in here and not be too lost. You won't know the boy I'm talking about yet but I think you will do okay. But I will say the last couple of chapters were considerably more dramatic than this one. We kind of closed one arc of, of the plot in, in the last chapter and now we're kind of starting into a whole new thing which means we're at the bottom of the hill going up and this chapter is mostly a sort of sweet little happy thing rather than a big bellowy dramatic crazy thing. That That's next chapter. <laughs> um, so before I start can I just say a quick thank you to you guys for your continuing enthusiasm and patience with me with this as there has been a bit of a break between the last chapter and this one and I know some people were getting impatient and actually thank you for getting impatient and for kicking me up the arse on Instagram. <laughs> you got me back to it and I, I have my enthusiasm back and uh, I'm all in pink and purple now because they make me think of 16 year old me these colours particularly pink I was a very pink 16 year old. <laughs> Without further ado I am going to shut up and start reading to you if that's not an oxymoron. Uh, so this one is just called The Summer of 2001 and here we go. <laughs> Wipe it away. Wipe it clean. The secrets I told you about me, about Ash, about the future. I need you to forget them. I can't let you break his heart, that boy, by telling him how it all goes, how f***ed the future is that lies in front of him. I promise you, Ash, it's not all that way. You'll explore jungles too. You'll drink buckets of rum and coke on beautiful, beautiful beaches in Thailand beneath a huge tropical moon. We'll go to Amsterdam together, a lot. That gorgeous, cosy little city where weed and shrooms are legal. And cheese tosties taste like the nectar of the gods. And you'll learn accents and stride about on stages. There's magic in your future too. And you aren't dead yet, Ash. Not even there, that stupid dark future I dreamed the other night. You still weren't dead. Neither of us were, in some bizarre twist of miracle. And that means there's still hope for you. I think there's always hope for someone as magical as you. Maybe you'll have a really life-changing midlife crisis. Get back to travelling the world. Or become the world-famous actor, photographer or director you deserve to be. Maybe you can still learn to be free. But, look, right now, that doesn't matter. It's 2001, Ash. We're safe here, wrapped up tight in your single bed. Leave the adult world to the adults. Forget those stupid dreams I had, visions of some distant, eerie future where the phones could do everything. They could take pictures. They could direct you around town, get you on the internet even, with screens that were in full colour. Everyone was wearing masks too. These surgical masks? They were all doing it in every shop I saw. There was even this plague-looking test centre just down the road, in the park you always called the local swamp. It was pretty Stephen King. I don't know what the f*** had happened in that creepy future, but I didn't much like it. So we're not going to think about that anymore. I'm not psychic, Ash. Neither are you. 
your mum, maybe a little, but that's how I like it, more or less. The imperfect, perfect world we live in right now, 2001, the new millennium. Isn't that futuristic enough for now, for us? And it is this summer, it's perfect. While school's still in session, it isn't. It's study leave. I only have to turn up for exams and who cares about them? I could always ace an exam without trying. It was projects, referenced essays I didn't have the attention span for. So this perfect summer, we basically just split the week between my place and Ash's, but always, always together. Except for two awful nights a week. Just enough to convince my parents that I really am studying hard for my GCSEs. I've been alone my whole life, honestly. Stuck in that bleak pre-internet wilderness. I've been alone right here, in this room. Staring out at the suburban sunshine I can never go out in. Never be a part of. My town is riddled with bullies. The scumbags from my high school. So, no matter how beautiful the weather is, I'll be right here, in my room, in the shadows, watching the sunlight pass over and fade away, wishing I could make my heart stop beating with the sheer force of will. <laughs> that never worked, obviously. It's kind of a bummer, side isn't that easy, but equally, I doubt any of us would be left if it was. But what I'm saying is, you think I'd be used to it by now, right? Being alone, I mean? Not just up here, but god, even worse, down in London at my dad's place? I did that every other weekend for 14 years, and I should get a f medal in isolation survival. I was fully practiced at being lonely, sad, misunderstood, alone. It shouldn't have been anything new to me. But as soon as I met Ash, discovered this insane, beautiful butterfly of knowledge that I wasn't alone. I got to spend time with my walls down and someone else in here with me. And it was like all the armor I'd built up over my whole life just shattered. I forgot how to be my own armor because that, <laughs> it became Ash's job. He was my armor and I was his, but every Wednesday, and every Sunday, Ash had to go away. Just to keep our parents happy. And for the first time in days, I had to sleep alone. No smell of ash, no thin limbs wrapped around me, no whispered conversations that petered out into sighs and slow, peaceful breathing. The silent absence of his heartbeat under my ear was deafening. The aloneness crushed me. Ash felt more like my twin than my boyfriend sometimes. Like a part of me that always should have been there but somehow got forgotten. Our God was not infallible. I was an incomplete person till he was around. And then suddenly he wasn't. Around, I mean. It didn't matter that it was only for one night at a time. The lack of him bounced off every wall of the house. My mom didn't get me. Didn't get my depression outright mocked it sometimes. And I hate to put that in here because she's like super mom these days. But back then, mm, fuck. she didn't get anything about having a busted up kid. All her attention went to my little brother and she'd pull these miserable mocking faces at me, then whip out, snap out of it. It's no wonder you've got no friends when you walk around with a face like that. If your mom is like that, just know there's still hope. Even mums are still learning. But back then, at times, I tried to tell her, I'm never happy, mum. I don't even remember what happy feels like. And she'd ignore me completely, or tell me I had nothing to be miserable about, or that it was listening to all that depressing music that did it. <laughs> never once was it suggested that I get a therapist for my unending misery or go on medication. I was every bit as lost and alone in that house as I was at school or anywhere else in this cold, uncaring world. Those Wednesdays and Sundays, they hurt more than any random day of the week has a right to. It was 
a little better. The times that Ash forgot his baggy black hoodie and I could at least curl up with something that smelled like him that reminded me he was really real, really out there. Not just some figment of my miserable mind that I dreamed up to save me because when I was alone like that in my shithole town again, Ash didn't seem real. Something as good as Ash in my shitty life had to be make-believe, right? So his hoodie, his scent, it was proof that he wasn't, that he was out there and probably feeling just the same. Often I kicked myself, sprawled out on the floor, Ash's burned copy of Pretty Hate Machine on the CD player, as the razor whipped its slick silver blade through my pale flesh, opening lurid crimson mouths that dripped bright young blood into balled up wadges of toilet paper. Sometimes the gashes would open up again in the night and I'd wake in the morning to a bed soaked in blood, wrinkles in the sheet that held so much gore it had all clotted into a big solid chunk and I'd have to tell my mum I had the worst nosebleed in the world or a really bad period disaster. I'm not sure how either thing would end up precisely where my arm lay, but she never seemed to question it. Anyway, by morning, however much blood I'd lost, everything was better. It was better because I was going to see Ash again, and when it was Thursday, it was at his place, 15 miles away from all my bullies, with his little green car sitting right outside, ready to whoosh us into the city for all the goth events. We basically lived on Red Bull that summer, and Ash thought it would be a fun project to collect all the cans in the back of his car. Eventually we had about 30 of the things, the whole car rattled like bells whenever he took a bend, and the smell of strawberry chemical glucose fizz hung heavy in the air. The smell of Red Bull always takes me back to then, to him. Every Thursday I'd pack my bag, get a lift to the station. There's no place so depressing as a train station, and that's a universal truth, judging by the lyrics to Nine Wild Nine. Depression always seemed to hit me so hard around trains. All that waiting, I guess? Way too much time to think. Wasn't like you had Instagram to surf back then, or even an iPod to listen to. You just existed. In the rainy grey coldness of the station, or in the bland grey sterility of the train, tears prickling behind your eyelids for no reason at all beyond the permanent pain of existing. But trains keep on moving, no matter how much the misery inside them weighs. It's the only good thing about them. Eventually I'd be through the city and out the other side, clambering off the train. And there he'd be, standing on the gloomy platform. Ash in his lace-up jeans and his big black hoodie, and we'd glue ourselves back together again with a great big gropey hug. And then his hand would be in mine, where it belonged. And that was okay. I had my armour back on. The weekends would be spent drinking lurid scarlet cinnamon aftershock at the Square Peg pub with the tainted mailing list goths, shopping for new club wear at the Oasis Market on a lazy Friday daytime, then getting ready for the goth club together. It was always packed out that summer, rock gut red wine bottles crowding the tables, Clove cigarettes and the enthusiastic fog machine emissions, smoking every photograph greyscale spooky. And after that, it was just us, me and Ash, back at his mum's idyllic farmhouse. Ash had a magnet for disaster stuck in his chest. I already told you that bit. But he also had an aerial sticking out of his head, and it picked up on the airwaves of anything called light years before anyone else heard about it. Whether it was books, music or movies, Ash was always the one to recommend the things I'd fall in love with forever. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and The Distillers being just two perfect examples. But that summer, he was the one to introduce me to Poppy Zebbright's writing. Lost Souls first, because we were young, and that was the one we related to. And once I'd read that, I insisted we try chartreuse. The alcohol Poppy said glowed in the dark and turned your eyes bright green if you drank enough. 
He always had the most brain-spinningly beautiful turn of phrase, Poppy, <laughs> and also the grandest stretch of artistic license. We were so very, very disappointed to discover that the liquor neither glowed nor changed our eye colour. But despite having been lied to so painfully by our literary hero, Chartreuse was, well, it was fucking delicious. It is, in fact, where I got my modern-day username from. Poppy's description of Chartreuse was that it tasted of a thousand herbs, a thousand altars, sacred and profane and boozy, the spirit of choice for his drunken, slutty, dangerous trio of vampires, Zilla and Molokai and Twig, reeling through the drunken heat of Bourbon Street, New Orleans, and, of course, the young, lost, misfit nothing whose name I took permanently as my new middle name in 2014. Nothing was my net name back then, my identity. Anyway, Poppy's lush, violent, soaring prose made a forever fingerprint in my soul, and Chartreuse, it was the taste of our nights that summer in Ash's room. When darkness fell beyond the tall trees and his mum went to bed, we smoked weed out of the window or down on the patio in the moonlight, then washed away the taste of burning herbs that was still so new and foul to me, with green, tingling gulps of herbal liquor brewed by the holy hands of a million monks. Giggling drunk, we stayed up all night talking, or f***ing, or both, then wild away the daylight hours, luxuriating in each other's tangled limbs, golden light spilling through the leaves of the forest to bathe us in sunlight. That was the first memory of my entire life, that I wanted to freeze frame, capture forever, live in eternally. It was just one normal, unremarkable afternoon, lying on Ash's bed. He was asleep, or nearly so. I'd just woken up. We were still knotted tightly together, my head on his chest, his breath tickling softly through my tangled hair. The window was open, the smells of sunlight and cut grass spilling warmly in on the breeze, and all I could hear was rustling leaves, rippling birdsong, the occasional distant sheep, and the languorous thumping of Ash's heartbeat. I was so comfortable, a rarity for any Aspie, and there was this sensation tickling around the edges of my brain that almost tasted like the memory of contentment. The sunlight shone warm on my back, Ash's body just as warm against my front and that grass-scented summer breeze rippled through the room. If the whole world had just stopped in that moment for the next 70 years, it would have been the perfect way to live out my lifespan, I thought. But it didn't. You already know that. So much changed for us, for the world. You can never freeze a moment. But I tried so hard in that instant that the memory of that scene is still as clear and sharp as the world's brightest diamond, even 20 years later. I found that if you try hard enough, you can freeze frame the world, a moment in time, keep it forever inside your head, lock down every single detail till it pops up like a tent inside your mind, this room you can wander back into again and again, curl up in, even when you're old and grey. The sunlight still feels warm, the summer breeze still blows in that frozen crystal moment deep inside my mind. I freeze-framed another one, too, that summer. Slightly cheekier one. I was on the bed again, he'd just taken a shower. I could smell the scent of his warm, clean skin across the room, and all he was wearing was a white towel wrapped round his waist slipping down to reveal the tops of his hip bones as he blasted the hairdryer into his face. <laughs> it was like this music video moment, man. Ash's blonde hair rippling back in the breeze in slow motion, like a goddamn Timote ad. Everyone said he looked like a Timote ad, but he really did that day. His body looked like a Greek statue, every line of musculature defined as a marble carving. He must have felt me staring. <laughs> he glanced back with a grin. I just kept on staring. Because that belonged to me. <laughs> Holy shit. 
How did someone with my crap luck ever land something, someone, as amazing as Ash? And more than that, how the hell did the walking statue in front of me not realise how perfect he was? Insecure as all hell about all of it, he'd much rather have been a regular sized bloke with a bit of a beer gut than the razor chiselled, cheekbone slicing supermodel he was. Sort of made me want to hit him sometimes. But that was it that summer. Our routine, week after week. As soon as a perfect weekend and a ghastly, lonesome Sunday night were over, Ash would be straight back here on Monday at my place and we'd lurk about till everyone was in bed, get out the sofa bed downstairs and drink Red Square, this Alka-Pop that was basically a solid litre of vodka Red Bull. We'd smoke weed, then take my little brother's scooter out for a stoned run up and down the road in the moonlight, laughing like crazy, our voices echoing off the houses. Then we'd come back in and have really quiet sex. <laughs> Finally, we curled up in a ball, fingers tangled into each other's hair, heartbeats synced, conjoined twins merging back into safety, into sleep. We'd been doing it for so long, in fact, that... I was under the impression my mum had got over it, that whole You are not to sleep in that boy's bed, do you hear me? You can watch TV down there, but you sleep in your own bed. Stuff she'd spouted at the beginning. <laughs> I'm not sure when she thought we had sex, if that's what she was trying to prevent. Did she think teenagers were like some weird species of nocturnal bat that can only go at it after 4am and so long as I was in bed within five hours of being left alone with him, coitus could not possibly occur? God only knows, she surely must have figured it out, but I guess sleeping down there too was a bit too flagrant. But like I said, I thought she'd gotten over it. Ash had been in my life for weeks now. So one morning, I hear my mum and my brother, who's ten and a complete pain in everyone's ass right now, making breakfast. I crawl out of the sex den sofa bed, wearing my big baggy evil inside top and a pair of boy shorts. Then I exit the living room where Ash is still peacefully sleeping and wander straight round to the kitchen to find some breakfast. But before I can even touch the box of frosted shreddies, I get an absolute f***ing talking to. You agreed that you were not to sleep in that boy's bed. I told you and you agreed. It is a bad influence on your little... I fell asleep in there, I interrupt, thinking fast. The other night, watching TV, no one seemed to mind, so I thought you guys were all right with it now. I am not all right with it, my mum shot back, hazel eyes like daggers. This is a Christian household. Okay, I agreed. Never again, which really just meant I'll be a lot sneakier next time, okay? I never really understood my mum's Christian household stuff. Either way, even my Christian mum didn't hit the roof about us sleeping together half as hard as Ash's did. Taylor was her name, Ash's mum. She always scared me a bit. Really high strung and just as expensive. <laughs> She tried to be the sex police too, constantly barging into Ash's room in the daytime on the pretense of her computer being glitchy or that she was doing laundry and needed a very specific sock. It was hilarious. We kept having to stop mid fuck, then thrash around the room like crazy people. Ash yelling, just a minute, mom, and her yelling, you open this door right now, Ashley, while... I threw my top back on and wriggled into my trousers and he dragged his clothes back on trying hopelessly to hide his boner until finally he opened the door and she huffed in to go on the computer. At which point we realised my red satin thong was right on the floor next to her left foot. And if she noticed it, Ash was going to have to claim ownership of that tiny crimson pair of knickers, opening a whole can of worms everyone could really do without. My, <laughs> my t-shirt was on inside out and back to front. And sometimes she commented, it's very stuffy in here. Open a window, Ash. As soon as she got out, Ash would laugh his ass off, saying she must have known it smelled of sex in there. But... 
the real root of all those sex police room invasions, it was all down to my age. Ash had told his mum on about my second visit that I was really just 16 years old. Four years younger than his 20. Precisely the same age as her youngest daughter Lucy, and she was horrified. Insisted on phoning up my mum to make sure I was even allowed to be here. Probably thought my mum was a terrible parent when she said yes. But they must have agreed to sex police the shit out of us on both ends, which sounds way kinkier than it ought to. No sleeping in the same room and regular daily interruptions. We skated around most of it pretty slickly. <laughs> but there finally came the day we royally cocked up. Ash's mum officially knew we were shagging. She hit the f***ing roof the second Ash went downstairs for snacks. It was weird, that place. Proper old farmhouse with red bricks and an arger, but its walls were like paper. You could hear everything. Or maybe it simply had more to do with the siren-like pitch of Taylor's tirade. I didn't hear a single word of Ash's calm, measured replies. And he liked doing that, staying perfectly calm while she was freaking out. It drove her right up the wall. I know what you're doing up there, came the banshee shriek from the kitchen below our room. Ashley, how could you? She is 16 years old. She is the same age as Lucy. She's just a baby and you're up there. You are up there doing... I caught the low rumble of Ash's voice. The calmness of his tone, but no words. That is irrelevant! She is too young for any of that! You could be done for statutory rape, for God's sake! Put on the sex offenders list for the rest of your life and... The low, relaxed mumbling interrupted her again. Well, I think you've got a screw loose if your father was here. She got cut off pretty promptly when it came to that one. I think I even heard him laugh. His response, I assume, was along the lines of... If Dad was here, he'd be congratulating me. That one blew her f***ing top. It is not a laughing matter. This is a child's future we are talking about. If you get her pregnant, that's your whole life down the drain, not to mention hers. I promised her mother that... I was getting increasingly uncomfortable about this involuntary eavesdropping as I sat on the must duvet of Ash's bed, staring boggle-eyed at the closed door. At some point, I was going to have to come out of this room to pee or eat or drink or leave. Ash might be perfectly casual about this screaming fit, but I wasn't. People didn't scream at my house, not unless it was me throwing a strop. There is nothing scarier than your partner's mum. That is a universal truth. Anyway, the conversation ended with what would become nearly a catchphrase. I'll be watching you, Ashley. And for God's sake, will you learn to use the f***ing dishwasher? <laughs> a few seconds later, Ash was back, laughing. Two cans of Red Bull and two bags of crisps in his hands, reporting. The matriarch isn't best pleased. She knows we're shagging. You probably heard. Yeah, I said, pulling a face and tearing into a bag of crisps. You better fetch dinner up here. I reckon I should neither be seen nor heard today. She doesn't hate you, he pointed out, slithering onto the bed and biting my neck. She just can't separate you from Lucy with the age thing. She doesn't get it. <laughs> I mmmed my agreement, but I knew precisely what Ash thought his mum didn't get. I wasn't like Lucy because Lucy was a virgin and I already wasn't by the time we'd met. Do you see why I'm so glad I lied about the virginity thing? At least at first. Ash might have felt exactly the same as his mum if he'd known that he really was corrupting me. And I was not losing the best thing I'd ever had in my entire life over a stupid concept like virginity. No one gets that wound up about any other first time, do they? I mean, your first kiss, maybe, but I tossed that one away too on not just one, but two random blokes at a Sisters of Mercy gig. And no one ever found out that was my first kiss, which was just the way I liked it. 
What's to be proud of about being a talentless beginner at something? Far better to practice on someone you'll likely never see again anyway. Summer 2001? I really was brand new. And Ash and I reveled in the newfound mischief of sex. Reveled in it to the nth degree. I liked the balls out mischief of f***ing in public. So we did it on a train one afternoon. In the tiny little bathroom. It was hilarious. There was just enough room with my butt perched on the sink shelf and Ash pressed up against me. But whenever the train stopped at a station... It got way too quiet to hide the creaking. <laughs> so we had to freeze mid-coitus, sniggering into our fists till the train moved on again. Then off we went. Creak, shag, giggle, creak. <laughs> That's the reason I have this photo. <laughs> Ash named it Dorian on boinktrain.jpg. We had to memorialise it somehow. We also tried fucking in his Citroen, pulled into a field on the way to a house party in the middle of a sunlit afternoon. Honestly, that was even more difficult than the train. His little green car was not built for sex in any position known to man, but we gave it a goddamn good try. Then came the particularly memorable night that, drunk on chartreuse, Ash's room dimly lit by the orange lamp that advertised some Australian beer or another, we had sex and decided to make our love for each other permanent. Visible. We took turns using the razor blade and carved our initials, enclosed in a heart, into each other's right buttock. The last time I checked, the scars of Ash's heart are still faintly visible on my butt. And, well, now you know where his life led... Maybe you'll understand why it makes me smile <laughs> just a little to know that his body is likely still labelled with the faint scars of my initials, the one mark of our friendship, our shared history that his choke chain of a mistress can never break nor erase. And we shed a lot of spilled blood that summer, particularly the glorious sunshine-filled week his family went on vacation leaving that big old farmhouse to us alone. The first thing Ash did was steal his mum's silver sports car, <laughs> grabbing the keys in my hand, grinning madly as he dragged me up the lawn towards that gleaming, sexy little chariot. Carefree, ecstatic, he stuffed nine-inch nails into the CD player, jumped into the low-to-the-ground driver's seat, and off we roared round the country lanes. Ash practically orgasming over every rev of the engine, every burst of wild acceleration. I still remember the way he glanced over at me when we're in this together now came on, taking my hand atop the gear stick as the summer breeze blasted our hair back. It was sort of our anthem that summer. And his neighbourhood was posh enough that Rich teenage brats roaring through the countryside in sports cars worth as much as a house, deafening music shattering the peace of the woodlands. It was a common enough sight to attract no police attention, thank God. The next thing we did with that parent-free week was to get more piercings. We rode the train into the city to the Oasis Goth Mall, and at Needleworks, a piercer friend of Ash's took a long, sterile needle and slid it smoothly through the soft pink flesh of my left nipple, then slipped in a neat little silver ring with a sparkly sky-blue gem for a closure. Ash got another hole stabbed through his ear. He already had a nipple piercing, which was the whole reason I wanted one. The downside, however, is that booze thins the blood, thins it till it pisses out of your brand new hole, and, in the case of my nipple, leads to a revolting train journey home with a bra cup filled with slippery, cooling blood. Thank God I was wearing black upon black, so not a drop of my grotesque vampiric lactation was visible to the world. As soon as we got back to the farmhouse, I whipped off my bra full of blood, and the best solution we could drunkenly dream up was a sanitary towel, sellotaped across my left tit. So that's what I wore. That and nothing else, besides my velvet skirt. Topless but for a jam rag and a bit of sellotape, I sat in the sunlit garden and we smoked weed, 
ash grinning away in happy cat mode. Would adulthood be like this, we wondered? Our own place that we could wander around in, butthole naked, growing weed and smoking weed and shagging in the bushes? We hoped so. It was about the only vision of adulthood we could tolerate. When we were at my place, Ash's presence even managed to make my shithole town seem less shitty. He always had the ability to spin things into his own web of magic, glossing over the grime and the bullying chavs, the relentless grey suburban depression. Ash just had this way of making anything feel like an adventure. One afternoon we had to go into the local town for something, god knows what, eyeliner probably, and as we walked through the underpass into the town centre, Ash glanced around, found his surroundings far too dull, and promptly stuck his right arm straight up into the air, fingertips rigidly clutching for the heavens, all whilst maintaining perfectly calm composure, as though he hadn't even noticed the odd behaviour of his own right arm. He walked for about half a mile, just like that. People around us were staring, whispering, pointing. But Ash's utter deadpan was so perfect, the entire world was thrown into total disarray. Was he doing it on purpose? To be weird? Or did he have some sort of bizarre disability that left his arm a few fortunate inches above a perpetual Nazi salute? No one knew. No one could work it out. I nearly died laughing. By the time we'd procured our eyeliner, Ash was in fine spirits and insisted on dragging me into Boots' toothbrush aisle, solely so that he could use his favourite quote from the League of Gentlemen. Ferreting through the toothbrushes, Ash grabbed one, flung it aloft, then howled theatrically, A dirty brush is a useless brush! Before slamming the thing back down on the shelf and storming self-righteously from the shop as I ran after him, laughing too much to breathe. Even when we were apart, Ash found his little ways to turn life into an adventure. He phoned me from the gas station he worked at one evening, purely to tell me about the new game they'd just invented. He and his co-worker would agree on an odd word or phrase, and then they had to slip it into conversation with the next customer, without that customer noticing that anything was amiss. Ash reported that the last game he'd won had been Squirrel. There were, of course, perfectly easy ways to do Squirrel, just a quick, oh, Wow, did you see that squirrel run past? It was pretty big. But Ash? God no. He never did anything the easy way. When that customer had walked in, Ash said, Ah, pump number two. Thank God. You don't want to go near pump number one. Out of service? Asked the bloke with disinterest, delving for his wallet. No, said Ash, deadpan. Oh, it's the squirrels. There's been squirrels nesting in that pump for weeks now. Cash or card, sir? Uh card, said the guy, turning to squint out of the window. Squirrels nest in petrol pumps. Oh yeah, yeah, all the time. Absolute nightmare. We have to get the pest control people in to de-squirrel the pumps every nesting season. That'll be 33.57 unless I can interest you in a snack or beverage today. And that was the tactic, said Ash. You stayed utterly composed, then you moved the conversation on before they could notice how f***ing weird you were. Ash left his phone lying on the till after that, so I could hear while he did the next one. He'd set the bar high this time. The word was flange. <laughs> Fifteen miles away, in my parents' bedroom, clutching our landline phone, I had all my fingers stuffed into my mouth to stifle my laughter as a female customer entered the shop and Ash began his practised patter. Oh, nice car, he said, bright and friendly. Bet it's not easy on the petrol, though. No, said a woman's voice, costs a fortune. Can I get a pack of Marlboro menthols and... Just a sec. I heard rustling around, then more rustling as chocolate or crisps were dumped atop the counter. Marlboro menthols, said Ash, conversationally. Quite partial to one of those myself. Ah, Maltesers. They're always good. Can I get you a flange bag with that, or are you all right? There was a long enough hesitation that I started to wonder if Ash had finally met his match and was about to get a bloody good slap. 
A what? said the voice, clearly uncertain, but remaining British enough to assume she'd misinterpreted. Flange bag, ma'am, Ash repeated, his deadpan so intense it was audible, rustling plastic at her. Free flange bag unless you've got room in your purse, and it's that cash or card today. Oh, no bag, thanks, said the woman, (laughs) seeming entirely at ease now. Clearly, a flange bag was a real thing in the world of gas stations. Ash's magic whispered to her soul, his flange, having just sailed straight over her head, not just once, but three times. Presumably, she couldn't hear the sound of a teenager dying of laughter through the phone on the till. Finally, she was out, and Ash picked up the phone again, asking happily, Do you hear that? How do you do it? I spluttered. How do you not laugh? I don't think he even had an answer. It remained his little secret. But honestly, once I got my first job in customer service, I pretty quickly learned that his secret was almost certainly the boredom of this place will drive you to anything by your third shift. Ash's next idea to jazz up the world was a lot darker. (laughs) bordering on outright tasteless. But I guess losing your dad so brutally at 17 means you have to laugh at death or you'll go insane. So we started driving around. Well, I'll tell you soon enough. We got that whole sleepy little town whipped up into a tiz with Ash's next scheme to make the world more interesting. And that was summer. It was perfect. But everything has to end somewhere. And summer's end? Fuck. It's particularly predictable when you're a teenager. You don't even have to wait for the leaves to change. It comes on much, much sooner than that. School was over for me at last. And initially, naively, I really believed that. School was over. College was starting, yeah, but college would be totally different, right? No more ties and blazers and horrible itchy grey skirts. You wore your own clothes and none of the stupid mean bully kids could attend and the only subjects you did you actually gave a shit about. It was gonna be great, right? Well, who knows? Maybe it would have been if my life had have walked a different path, if I had had stricter parents Parents who banned me from going out. Underage, underdressed, to nightclubs. Where I never would have met Ash. And that long, hot summer would have been nothing more than a long, hot misery fest. By the time college launched off, I still would have been a naive, miserable virgin. Desperate for any change in routine. I might have loved it at that college. But honestly, who the f*** knows because that's not the way my life went. Ash was in it. More than in it, he was the very centre of it. He was my everything. And college? It meant that after a whole summer of gorgeous escapism, I would be dwelling alone and depressed right back in the shithole scum town that had already shredded a thousand holes in my soul and even more gashes in my left arm. So how the fuck do you reckon it went? Anyone can guess it badly, but you know I never do things by halves, and neither did Ash. But what was totally unexpected was that Ash's mum didn't do things by halves either. When it came to me and Ash, and the fact we were stealing her sports car and f***ing each other senseless all over her house, She was reaching her absolute limit. And like I said, Taylor was seriously high strung. And like I said, more than that, Taylor was expensive. Money to burn, money to hurl at any problem on earth. So when she made her move, she made it big. Rich eccentrics do perfect storm better than the average tornado. (laughs) So, college? Well, shit. I didn't know it. Ash didn't know it. And the head teacher sure as shit didn't know it. 
but that place was about to get hit by the crazy storm of the century. <laughs> and that is where I am leaving it for this chapter, because the next chapter is college and certain other things that happened round about that time that year. I'm not going to spell it out, but I'm sure some people can join the dots um, as to yeah there, there was there was there was quite a lot of drama not just in my world but in the world round about that time college was an experience um an eventful one and uh and it ended in in an interesting way so that's the next chapter and i look forward to getting to that one with you and can i apologize from the heart of my bottom for the annoying noises in the background of this video i have literally no clue what people are doing downstairs but um anyway yes as i said at the beginning if you want to see the other chapters i will link the playlist below and uh yeah this chapter was obviously a little bit slower than than the previous couple as the previous couple were quite high drama and this one i just i just wanted to give you the nice the nice happy summer before we dive back into <laughs> crazy town again so anyway i will shut up and leave you alone now thank you very much if you came all this way through the story with me and you're still here maybe you're asleep i know a lot of people use these stories as bedtime stories so maybe you're asleep and as such i apologize for the snippets of parental bellowing <laughs> in the middle of this chapter i hope i didn't rudely wake you up anyway thanks for listening and i will see you with the next chapter which yeah is a lot a lot more kapow in a lot of ways um yeah uh <laughs> so i'll see you with that soon so i'm gonna shut up thanks for listening over and out bye, -bye. <laughs>